Good morning, everyone. So glad that you're here this morning. And uh, today we have a special Sunday where we get to share with you of what happened between uh, November 11th through and November 21st. Uh, six of us went somewhere and we did something. And uh, oh, well, sometimes uh, I'm, I, I need to be a little bit vague because uh, some countries are classified as closed. That means that they limit uh, of how missionaries can come and proselytize, you know. And so that's why, you know, we don't know how much to share or how much not to share. And so we're just kind of maybe, you know, by the grace of God, we're going to try to walk that line kind of finally, finally. But it's not just for us because people are already there and they're working and they're doing the uh, mission work there already. So we're trying to protect them um, also. Uh, I don't know if you heard about Several, maybe a year ago, there was a huge security leak in China, and so many of the missionaries had to be kicked out, and, um, and they're working somewhere else too, so we're going to do that. And so I'm going to show a, a video, so we, all of us is going to share a little bit, and after that, I'm going to have a short sermon. You know, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm going to try to promise you a short sermon, you know, and uh, then, then we'll close for the day. So before I, uh, we start, I'm going to show a video, a short video of what, what happened. And then after that, I'm going to ask uh, Brian to come up. Brian was our, our leader, and he led our team and, uh, from the beginning, and he did lots of work. Uh, and organizing, communicating to us, and communicating to the people over there. So make sure that we all go there and come back safely. And his job accomplished, we're all here safely. <laughs> So, okay, let me show you a video, and Brian will come up and share our first. So I want to say, first of all, I want to say thank you to Grace who made the video. Um, she was our uh, personal videographer, essentially. Um, and yeah, and then yeah. Second, I want to thank um, everyone who um, supported us with um, financially and through your prayers. Um, I think uh, Pastor said this trip was um, he, this is the most fruit he's seen in terms of church planting and church growing. So I want to thank um, everyone who supported us and allowed us to go. So 
we, um, on behalf of the team, um, we thank you for that. Um, so this first part, um, our trip, uh, we, we have like multiple parts. We, we went to different parts, um, sometimes to like different villages, sometimes to do children's. Um, so for me, what I'm going to do is I want to give um, a context about what the overseas uh, team was um, there doing. Um, our, our job when we went as a team wasn't to like just to go share the gospel and to do all of that. Um, our goal was there to encourage the team there and to serve um, the team overseas. Um, so whatever they were doing, um, we wanted to just do whatever they were doing. Um, so the um, first part, um, so next slide. So in here, Carson has six uh, steps or six books as to how um, he was going to go uh, share the gospel. And the most important um, thing to note here isn't that um, he's uh, going out there and sharing it by himself. What he wants was he wanted to create a system of multiplication, kind of like how our house church, we have a house church, and then when it's big enough, it grows on its own so that when it's time, he can exit. That, that's his end game. That's his goal. So in the first book, in the first step, he goes out and um, in there, um, in Luke chapter 10, I believe, um, basically he, he goes out with people two by two to go out and share the gospel. And um, in the first step there, you can see that he goes out and he goes to find a seeker group. Essentially, he finds a person of peace and he finds people who are interested and see if they want to know more about Christ. In the second book, he goes about and he's like, okay, now that everyone is interested, can we explain more about Christ to them? Explain like different topics, like how, um, like who God is, what's his character, um, how he hates idolatry. Um, one of the common things is that they have physical gods um, in South Asia. And so they would say, I accept Christ. But when they accept Christ, they don't accept Christ as the one and only God. They accept Christ as part of their other list of hundreds of gods. And they're like, we're just a part of them. So we want to make sure that they understand who God truly is. And then in the third step, um, this is where they are going to go. Um, uh, like equipping the believers. Um, this is where they're like starting to have a church. And this is also where the person um, can baptize um, all the people there. And then um, and around this step, uh, members will also be encouraged to go out and to share the gospel and start seeker groups. So start steps one and two again. And so while that's also happening in the fourth step, this is also the time to develop leaders. So they could like, if there's a church there, then they'll be like, hey, we're going to develop more leaders and, and all of that. And then in um, the fifth step, they continue developing the leaders um, and to teach them how to share the gospel. And around this time, there's also other secret groups and other churches that have formed. So they go out and they like talk and like, hey, how are these groups doing? Um, and then finally, in the sixth step, I think that's when like, hey, my art, their job is done and they're going to share the bigger vision. Um, and so I think um, in when we went there, I think most churches that they've seen to, I think the farthest step that they've gone is probably step like three or four, somewhere around there. So they haven't gotten to six. Um, if For those who are there, if they want to know a uh, quantifying number, they want to see four generations of churches because it means that they were able to train leaders who can train leaders who know how to train leaders to be leaders. So, so they want that like multiplication. So when they leave, they can like do all of that. Um, so yeah, if you want to know um, how um, they do it in the New Testament um, and where they got this model, it's based on the New Testament. It's based on um, Epaphras in Colossians. Um, that's that's where they like learn part of this model. So if you want to um, hear about that, that that is where you can find it in um, the New Testament. So now I'm going to invite the next member up to talk about um, our actual trip. Now that there's context about what our trip's about, they're going to actually come and talk about the actual trip. Thank you, Brian. Okay, so I'm going to go through the whole week at a glance, and then I'll just talk about that first day walking around Kolkata. So Monday, we did a walking tour with two local missionaries that they've lived there for 23 years. 
and we got to see more of the city and get accustomed and try to stay awake was our main main goal that day. And then Tuesday and Wednesday, we went to a small town uh, about five hours away, and we trained the local Christians how to go out and share the gospel and actually got to share with them. And then we also got to work at a women's, um, they, they make... They make different clothing and things like that. And we shared with them a the PAD project, which is about women's health and the cycle, and got to share the gospel through that. And that was really incredible because so many, it was their very first time hearing the gospel. And then on Thursday, we traveled to back to Kolkata, and we did some evangelism in the college there. And then Friday, we went to a Kali temple and... Um, I think Grace will share more about that. And we also did a children's program where we shared Lazarus and sang and danced with them and did some crafts. And then on Saturday, we did another children's program, but we did a prayer walk by where we were staying and heard more about the vision that Brian just talked about. And then the final day on Sunday, we debriefed as a team and pastor preached and we we sang in front of in front of everybody there as well. So that's the week at a glance. So Kolkata has about 15 million people. It's a really big, loud, dirty city. Um, the air quality there is like 340 and here it's 40 for context. So a lot of people are coughing and it's really loud. The two missionaries that we walked around with that first day, they have hearing damage from, from, and tinnitus from all of the noise. And so we were walking around the city and you can see just so much poverty, but also a lot of wealth that is throughout the city just back to back, um, right next to each other. So that, that's that first one. We did an eight hour work walking t- tour with the local missionary couple. And it was incredible to see the real city from their eyes and hear the story. As we walked around, we prayed and, and just kind of listened to what God was telling us about this city and its people. We went on a local, um, the tram through it and, and got to go all over the city, and we went over, this is the river that's by the Haura Bridge, which is a famous bridge for Kolkata, but um, you can see along the river how everybody's worshiping their gods, and they're crying out, and they're bowing, and um, it's a very religious city, like every couple of steps you'll see another little temple, and people being blessed, or having paint, or things on themselves, Um, But we heard the stories of people um, taking their idols and taking it to the river, and then they just fish out this, all of the trash that's left from it because they're just made out of sticks and mud and straw. Um, But we saw, we saw idol makers um, making these idols throughout the city. We went to Victoria Memorial, and that's kind of what I was talking about. There's a lot of richness here. They all came together and made this memorial for Queen Victoria, and um, you can you can see that right next to people being very poor. But that's Victoria Memorial, and then we went to the Red Light District, and this is also in Calcutta, and. The two missionary couples right there, you can see them in their first picture. They created this business to work so that women that are in the red light district have another opportunity and they now sell things all over all over the world but we heard the story of the woman in the middle with grace she is now one of the managers of the organization and she's running it but you, we heard her story of how she was from upper caste. They had casteism for a long time in India, and still, it's still there. Um, but she was from a richer family, and she came, and they were telling her, "You need, you need to live our life. You need to live." here and work here because she was coming in from a nicer area and didn't want to eat any food and didn't want to to sit with them. But um, so she moved into this little tiny 
tiny um, like hut with one of the women and there were rats and cockroaches and um, she would eat the, the food that they had mushed by hand and ate it with her hands. And um, I don't know, it was really eye-opening to see like as what they see is missionaries coming and saying, oh, you guys are doing a great job and here's some money and then you never see them again. But being someone that goes there and lives there and lives the life that they live is just so much more powerful. And so it was really cool to hear her story. And that last picture is a picture of um, all of the workers that work there right now. Um, and then I'm going to just say one more thing. So at the very end of the day, I just felt really angry and sad. Um, and I cried myself to sleep that first night because I think there's so much lostness in the city and there's so much darkness. There's very few Christians. There's not, you can't just go to a church and it's this many people there. There's just, um, people worshiping other gods and feeling like their gods hate them. And it's just so dark. And I woke up in the middle of the night thinking like, this is God's heart for these people, this anger and this sadness. Um, it was really incredible to be there, but it was really hard to feel and to see that. And I think that first day was, was just so stark for me. Um, but I, I'm really glad that I was able to go. So I'm welcoming up Giovanni for day, day two. Thank you so much, Sarah Joy. Made me relive everything. <laughs> uh, we did um, evangelism and training on the second day. We went off, like she said, about five hours away from Calcutta, and we had a great time with that church there. Um, there was about 30 to tw 20 to 30 people there, um, depending on the day, on day one and day two. And we g gathered together and did a little training session. We taught them how to present the gospel, how to have leading questions to share the gospel, and how do you actually invite people to church? And so we sat around, Brian and I held one group, Caleb and um, Pastor held the other group, and we just gathered together and talked and shared about um, what book two said. What, um, in the beginning, he mentioned a series of book. We were just basically teaching them book two. Um, and we started off, how do you start a conversation? Gospel is good news, but for it to be good, you have to first share why it's good. It's dark. The world is dark. And so we start by asking leading questions about death. Everyone deals with it. The US, we have that issue. India, turns out, they do have that issue too. <laughs> and so uh, death is a deep and dark topic there as, as over here. And so how do you even lead to that? How do you go to that uh, topic? So we would ask questions like, um, um, what, what's your favorite deity? What did your deity do for you? Can I tell you about my God and how, uh, what my favorite part of my deity is? And just share about how he has solved the problem of death. Or uh, what do you think the biggest problem in the world is? And then you share about how I think the biggest problem in the world is death. No one has solved it yet except Jesus Christ, right? And so we would tell them a series of leading questions to help guide them towards the gospel. And then when the time came and they were responsive, they were both listening and they and the person sharing was listening to them. If it was a good conversation, then we engage. Share the gospel gently, sweetly, tactfully, lovingly. And this is a little bit of what we shared. We would share about how Jesus, how God created everything good. And there was no problem. Man had a loving relationship with God. But mankind wanted to be king. And that, diso that disobedience, that dishonors God. And when you dishonor God, that's sin. And that leads to death, eternal death. And now all these problems come seeping into the world. And how does man try to solve these problems? We will tell them money, relationships, and um, religion. We try to do all of these things to please God, to solve our problems, but none of them help. And so what did God do? We shared with him at the right time, Jesus Christ came, who is God, became man, and was born into the world. Sinless life, and with his sinless life, he paid for our sin. And that sets us free from the judgment of sin. And so on the third day, we see how he did it. 
he died and rose again. And so if you actually believe in this gospel, if you believe um, that he paid for your sin, you'll be set free from that punishment. But if you don't believe, you still receive that punishment from your own sin. And the punishment is still eternal hell. And so then we shared for them. On the last day, Jesus would judge the world of their sin. And if you believe, even though you die, you will be resurrected and have eternal life. That's the hope. And we'll dwell with God forever, again in a world that's good, with our relationship with God restored. The heartbreaking thing for me while leading this Bible study um, with Brian is that there's not enough disciples. They're all young Christians. And they need disciples. So pray for them, for maturity, for them to be able to have good disciples to lead them to the knowledge of the gospel, for them to be able to share soundly the word of God. And that's what I have for the evangelism training. And then at the same time, <clears throat> sorry, um, me and Jolly and our missionary and a translator, we went to different places to do this woman's garment project, which is pretty much we have uh, we talk about like periods and menstrual cycle and the uh, story of the bleeding woman and also the gospel. And we were able to reach a lot of non-Christians this way um, because they don't really talk about this in the culture. Uh, so we went to a tailor shop the first day. Um, and yeah, as Jolly was saying earlier, a lot of people, they raise their hand when we ask them, is this your first time hearing the gospel? And some of them uh, were Christian and the owners of this shop were Christian. So th what they did is they have like maybe a third of them that work there and they're training the other two thirds and teaching them how to sew. Um, a lot of them are pretty young, but their mothers have already like two or three kids because um, the women get married really young. And... It was really impactful to be able to, I never really shared the gospel to a whole group of people that were actively listening and curious and like, what is this that you're talking about? Um, and it is very exciting because most of them um, are like Hindu in this uh, group. And then we went back the next day to train the uh, leaders or the shop owners on how to share the gospel and how to disciple their employees or the people that they know or just to share on the streets. And that was really cool. That's the same um, book that we, we, they were doing with the men and at the church. Um, and we also went to a school building and got to do the same thing. So we did this, I think, three times. Um, and then one of the times that I don't have pictures for, we were at the church again, and the church, um, the pastor's wife, she had invited some Muslim women that lived nearby. So they were all sitting there and we're like talking about Jesus. So we have to make sure like we use the right words and everything. Um, but one of them, they, it was also kind of diff dis difficult because um, they're like pretty distracted and they had to leave early um, for their prayer time. But one of the women, she stayed and she was curious and we were able to talk to her about who Jesus is and pray for her and even go to her house, um, which is really cool. Just being able to, um, yeah, like share the gospel with even one person and have them be curious. And um, the pastor's wife knows her, so she's able to continue building that relationship and connecting. And then... I'll share briefly on our college evangelism day. So throughout the whole time, we didn't really know that many words in the language. So we used our translator. Or we like could say like, thank you and like, hi. <laughs> um, but at the college, most of them spoke English. So that was really fun, really exciting. And um, because we look a little bit different or we're foreigners, they're curious. So one group of people that Jolly and I went up to, we were like, hi, like, hello. And they're like, oh, come sit down. And like, where are you from? Like, what are you doing here? And we got to start that conversation and ask them about what they believed. Um, and a lot of them had different responses. But one girl, she said that like, my parents are Hindu. They believe in all these gods that I can't even count but I feel like there's just one God and we're like yeah <laughs> uh, <laughs> so you're able to share the gospel and connect her with one of the missionaries that lives there so that's really cool um, and then I'll share a little bit about Kali Temple so 
this is a pretty big temple for one of the gods of the many. And pretty much we went there and it was very overwhelming. Um, there are people, they had to pay to get in. It was really dirty. There's like people selling things on the side. Um, there's a long line to even get into the temple to do like offerings or things like that. And it's very sad to see like people are, they want help in their life. They want hope or peace. And they're going to this place that is, they have to wait so long and pay money and giving offerings and you know putting money into this fertility tree. And we know like there's no one that's gonna be hearing that. Like that's not a real God who's gonna help them or listen. Um, so it was very overwhelming. And we even like got to hear uh, a goat being sacrificed, which I've never heard before. <laughs> uh, but goats kind of scream, and it sounds kind of like people. So yeah, that was overwhelming. But I think kind of like Jolly was saying too, just asking God for his heart for these people. Um, and I think for me, going on this trip really revealed the need for missions. Like, we were looking at the numbers, and there's maybe like 0% or 1% Christian for each people group. And I was also thinking about it, how there's those like big buildings we went to, like the Victoria Memorial or things like that. And it's not that this is the first time Christians have ever come to India, but it's that I think we need more. We need more people to help disciple, more people to share the gospel and um, reach them. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I'll be, I'll be talking today about the children's ministry that we helped out at. So also, if you're wondering, we got these in, like, the first church that we helped out. It's to, like, honor us because we, I don't know, we did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe it was just because, like, yeah, we were just there, and we sat down on, like, their, their church floor for, like, multiple hours, and my legs have never hurt that much just from, like, crisscross applesauce and like my ankles are hurting and like eating getting eaten alive by bugs so they just they gave us this um <laughs> just for memories um so i'll be talking about the the children's ministry uh we went to two different uh i guess church areas for um, their children's ministries and the first one um when we like first arrived there um, I was in the car with one of the missionaries, and their son was there. He's only seven years old, and like all the kids like run out, and they're like, you know, they're like chasing the car because they don't. There's no like respect for personal space, so like they're just like they're like, basically touching the car as we're driving. And then like the the son, his name is August, is like, oh, I don't want to go out there, mom. And then his mom's like, no, go play with the kids. He's like, I don't want to play with the kids. There's too many of them because like they're all just like swarming, it's like a, a whole beehive. Like you know, you like unlock the beehive. Um, but yeah, they all came running out, and they were just so joyful to to see us and to see like I guess different people. They don't really see foreigners that often. And then they immediately like are starting to play games and running around and just doing what children do. And the smiles on their face like show how much joy they have. Uh, and then we have to like, you know, settle them down. And then we, we taught them a lesson about Lazarus, um, the guy who died. And then Jesus brought back to life. And we kind of shared more about the, the gospel, basically. And then from that point, um, we like, did a skit where we... like reenacted it and then we had like the kids reenact it and they were like so silly and like you know pretending to die and whatnot and I don't know they were just being children and then after that we had a craft so we we basically um you can see in the the left photo we're all like drawing like the stone that Lazarus was like you know put away and then like we made these like little spoon Lazarus mummies where like you, it's like you know you get a spoon and you wrap it with um, like a small like cloth kind of like a shoelace and then you put two googly eyes so it looks like a little mummy and then he like, comes out of the tomb and whatnot um, and like you know in America where you tell kids like oh like, here's the craft and then they're like oh that's a dumb craft like I don't want to play with that but like, here you know you give them the crayons and like 
this paper plate and then like all of them are like so intently focused like coloring every single little thing and i'm like well they're like really go and we'd have to like tell them like okay that's enough like we're gonna move on to the next part because like they would just keep going like or i just keep coloring and then like once they fill out everything like okay that's done they're like no i'm not done yet and then they get like another color and start coloring over the color that they already like colored on you're like all right well we'll move on and then we we you know taught them and then we played games with them um so we played sharks and minnows and um, you can see that in like the uh it got like nighttime so we played games and then we like played soccer basically and they're all running around like crazy kids and smiling and then we brought out this projector and we like hung up uh like a bed sheet and then we played some bible um, like the Bible project videos in their native language. So they got to like experience that and see it. And it's like a movie theater for them. Like, you know, you put it up and you can kind of see that the area they live in, um, is kind of impoverished. So there's not many like, you know, nice areas, but then right behind them, there's like, you know, sky skyscrapers and all these other buildings. So, um, it really showed me that, you know, their circumstances is very different than what we're used to because for them just running around and playing is like all they need but then you know you come back here and people are like oh if I don't have my iPad or my iPhone like I'm not I'm not gonna have a good time but for them it's that they only have like each other and the relationships that they have um, the other place that we we helped at we didn't take any photos but we basically did the same thing so we talked to the kids played games and then um, we also that area they have like a uh, soccer or you know football in their culture uh, ministry where they teach the kids how to play football and they uh, get up at like six to eight to uh, practice like t twice a week I'm like I didn't do that when I was like in the 10 years old but they would do that and then they had these um, a computer ministry so they teach them how to like, use the computer and basically I don't know all the other computer applications I'm, I'm assuming it's like word and powerpoint stuff like that um but yeah those are other um applications that another church used to help um, bring people out of the poverty because a lot of the time you know, they get grown up in there and they said that a big problem is for the the woman when they're like between 12 and 16 they're like preparing them for marriage so like they don't even have a like a chance to grow any of their skills because they just kind of like oh look you're getting married okay well we don't like we'd rather just have you go off with your husband who's like 25 and it's kind of like you know it's, it's a little bit difficult difficult for them to now like take a step back and like oh i want to learn something else like no now you're a wife you don't have any say in what we do so um this um the children really reminded me that our external circumstances don't determine what our inner joy comes from and how much we can like depend really on the holy spirit because you can see that um the people who are ministering here the the woman and the men who are like raising up the children in the church are really pouring a lot of effort and showing them this is like the gospel and then like we have a hope to live and we have like a joy to be um to be happy so then you can just see it externally. I mean, all the kids are just like completely like bonkers. They're just loving life, even though they don't have like what you would say is like a good life. Like there's not like they don't have food all the time or they don't have video games or they don't have um, stuff like that, that in American culture, it seems like, oh, without that, we would be um, not having a, a happy life. So thank you. In India, when I preached, they gave me an hour to preach, you know, and so, uh, but I'm not going to ask for one hour. Oh, actually, all my slides are wrong. Dang it. Yeah. Anyway, it's okay. Um, well, um, I'm so proud of our team. Um, they did really well. We worked really well. We didn't have any major conflicts, you know, we had fun, and we came closer with one another, and, uh, you know, just so proud that they sacrificed seven days of their PTO, right, and that's a big deal, right, that's their sweat, sweat and blood, and they had to, um, you know, their vacation time to make this happen, and their sacrifice was well worth it, I think, for them.
Well, every time we go on a mission uh, trip, I, I have these four um, goals. One is like to develop a global perspective of how God is working. Right? It's not just like God works right here. God's working all over the world as we sang that song. And, and really encourage the people who is already doing the work over there. Right? When we go to Mexico, we go to any other places, same thing. Yeah, and also it uh, vitalizes our spiritual uh, lives as well. As, as you get involved with God, right, it helps us. Right? As you give, you gain so many things. And also to present the good news of Jesus Christ in whatever context that God gives us. And in that uh, context, I want to show you, I share with you one verse. It's Matthew 24, 15, and uh, oh, 24, 14. And it says this, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Let me read it one more time. Uh, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. You know, so God's plan, right, from the beginning, here at the beginning, and there's an end that's coming, right? Even the, our physics class tells us, right, our sun is not unlimited, right? It's not going to go on and on forever and ever, our, our sun is basically a hydrogen bomb, right? It has a limited number of hydrogen atoms, right? And one day it's going to kaput and the end will happen for sure for all of us, you know, especially living in, in earth. So God's plan right, for the end is there and he wants the, uh, the end to come, you know, when all the gospel is being preached. So in this verse, it tells us, the four questions and four answers this verse, this verse gives. The first question is that, what do we preach? What are we supposed to proclaim? Right? And he says right here, the gospel of the kingdom. Right? And Jesus came and you know, preached the kingdom. John the Baptist preached the kingdom. Right? And the good news of Jesus Christ. And the, when you think about kingdom, right, there's king. And there's dumb, right? There's a king and dumb means it's the domain. The king, the, the, the rules, right? The, the influence this king has over, right? And there's that relationship between king and the... And so you could see it as like a country or like a family, right? And, and we had to get our passport and get our visa in order for us to get into the country, right? And, and so that's the gospel. Gospel is the method that God invites us into the family of God. How we can go into his country. That country will live forever and ever. That will last, be there for again and again, forever. Right? And so that ought to be what we'll be preaching. The preaching, the gospel of the kingdom. Right? So that's what we need to proclaim all the days of our lives. Not just when we go to mission field, right? but in our lives, and in two-minute conversation, 20-minute conversation, and whatever the conversation is, right? the good news of Jesus Christ ought to be the best news that we ever carry for us and for us to proclaim that good news of Jesus Christ. So what do we preach? Gospel of the kingdom. Where? Where do we preach? It says it will be preached in the whole world. Right? So the whole world, the uh, gospel needs to be preached. And that's what Jesus did. That's what John the Baptist did. Right? And that's what the follower of the Jesus did in the book of Acts. Right? And, and, um, and so that's why we take the gospel to the whole wide world. Right? And, and, and number three question, whom? To whom would he do that? Right? And Bible says, as a testimony to all nations, right? And, and, and again, this word nation is not 196 countries that is recognized by the UN, right? But it's talking about the ethnic group, ethnos, right? People groups, right? And according to Joshua Project, there is 24,000 people groups in the world, right? It's divided by their language, uh, culture, even different dialects, right? Different kinds of customs and behavior, Right, they have this kind of, or even how some of them are enemies with one another, right? And we need to send multiple people to mo those areas so that gospel can be preached. Very interesting fact, right? Here, that whenever you hear word testimony or witness in the Bible, that word is actually in Greek, mar marturian. Everybody say it with me, marturian. Yeah. What word in English remind you of? Martyr, right? So being a witness, 
being a testimony is related to be a martyr because when Jesus calls them, it's kind of scary for us, right? And when Jesus calls us, he says, deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. Our life is already belongs to Christ. Amen. When we say yes to Christ, that's what he say yes to. Maybe some of you guys didn't know that, but now you do, right? Yeah, and it is a very startling thing to recognize that my life does not belong to me anymore. It belongs to Christ. Christ created us. He bought us with his precious blood that we belong to God. We are his family, right? In his kingdom, then we are to there forever and ever, right? And so... Um, you know, when you look at Revelation chapter 7 and 9, we see after this, I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, every tribe, every people, and every language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And they were worshiping God. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and the Lamb of God. Right? And we get to see that. So there's different ethnic groups, right, that we have to go and to preach the gospel. And, 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 and what's the result? Right? The Bible says, and the end will come. The end is there, end is coming. You know, right? End is coming when all the people uh, get to hear the good news of Jesus Christ and given a, given a chance to respond to that. Right? And, and, and the Bible talks about end as such a beautiful thing. Right? We're no, no more suffering, no more tears. And sometimes as you live this world long enough, right, what do you usually say? Oh, Lord, come. Right? We, we want, you know, Scotty, beat me up. Right? We want, we want just go right to the, to the happy place, right? That place. And that's the place that God has uh, given us and, and prepared for us to live there forever and ever. And, of course, we have the little ones that we want to make disciples of all nations. And even the picture that God says to us, right? The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Isn't it a good thing to see harvest? Right? Harvest is a good thing. That's how we get our food from. Yeah. And Jesus is saying, this is good for us, seeing the harvest, right? And the, but the workers are few. The pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out more workers, right? And so as an application, Right? I, 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 I want to share with you this one verse and share three application points. And this verse is how they, the, the team that we work with and how they pray over. Right? It's Habakkuk 2.14. Uh, Habakkuk 2.14, it says, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Right? As the waters cover the sea. And how much of the by sea is covered by water, 100 <laughs> percent, right? It's not a matter of they have a you know um, drought and stuff. That's how water covers the sea, 100 percent. And as much as that 100 percent of coverage, we want right. God's will is that that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will be filled on earth as well. Amen. Yeah. We want the knowledge of the glory of the Lord to be filled. To be filled in our lives, in our city, in our church, right? In our, in, in our country, and in all over the world, right? As we take the gospel of the kingdom to the ends of the earth. So, so three prayer points, uh, three application points. Pray. Pray that this over, over, right? Over again and again. Right? What did I say? Habakkuk what? 2.14, right? So you know what they do? They set an alarm and there are clocks, on their phones, 2.14 p.m., right? Not 2.14 a.m. But if you can, if you want to do that, that's fine too. Yeah, 2.14 p.m., so whenever that goes off, right, it remind you of this, this, this verse, Habakkuk 2.14. I want the knowledge of the glory of the Lord to fill this earth, fill my life, right? And fill our church and fill our city so we can pray that the VIPs, the people who do not know Christ, will get to know Christ, Right, we'll come to know Christ and also the, all the efforts of the missionaries in all over the world that their efforts will uh, be accomplished, right? So that many people will get to hear the gospel and respond to the gospel. And also the, the next application is to practice sharing the gospel. How we need to practice that? We, you know, uh, Giovanni gave a, like a two-minute version of it, but I think we need to have a two-hour version of it. 
And I think we need to have a lifetime version of it. As you do life, how do you share your, your, the gospel? How does the gospel permeate in us and through us as you do life? If somebody does life with you all week long, man, I really see gospel in this person. In the ways that he, you know, appropriate the gospel into his life and in others' life as well. How do we say that? How do we live that out? Right? And so we have two-hour version. We call that Receive Jesus Meeting. We try to you know, do that every, every month. So people who do not know Christ yet, sign that up. And so I will present the gospel to them and how we need to practice. One of the things that I said, because it was very fruitful, and the first day we trained them and we went with them and we did it on the streets and people's homes. They flopped it. Next day, we gave them feedback and we retrained them and they did so gloriously. Yeah, we got so many phone numbers, so many green lights and everything. Now how we need to practice, right, and do it, and give feedback, and redo it, right? And so we need to practice it for ourselves as well, because the people are lost here as well. And also participate in the future opportunities. You know, we, uh, well, you know, I promised them that I'm coming back in January 2024. So uh, start saving up your PTOs and saving up money, you know, so we can go. Right, and there are other other opportunities in this city and other uh, in in other mission trips as well. Uh, Lord willing, we will go to Japan and Korea, right? And so save lots of money and save lots of time. Be trained, practicing, sharing the gospel, right? Even to your close friends, so that you know, and they can give you some pointers. And I don't know about this or that word or things like that. How we need to practice, and practice makes it permanent, right? And continue to pray. Right? Habakkuk what? 2.14. 2.14 p.m. Right? And set your alarm on your phone. Right? And maybe not sound, but vibrate, you know, so that you can, you know, quietly pray for those things that uh, what, the, what the Lord is trying to do in this world. Amen? Amen. So let me pray for us. And um, let me um, invite our worship team back. And... Um, and as we... Respond to what we have heard and what the Lord has done. We want to recognize that harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. And as we pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out more workers, maybe God will stir in your hearts where we can pray, start praying, Lord, is it me? Do you want me to and how? Do you want me to adjust uh, in the great work that you have begun to do in this world? So, Father God, we pray that you, you stir our hearts. You give us insights. You give us your word to come alive and for us to be challenged and adjusted and, and start praying and, and start sharing with others so that we can be used by you. Not just overseas, but in right, right here as well, Father God. So we pray and we give our lives unto you. This is life is, doesn't belong to us anymore. It belongs to you. You are the Lord of our time. You are the Lord of our treasure. You are the Lord of our talents. You are the Lord of all, Father God. So Father, you take it and you use it however you want to use it. So uh, as you continue to break our hearts in the reality of how dark and how lost uh, people are, Lord, so use us, Father. Father, we are yours to use. So we give our offerings, our tidings unto you, Father, so that you can use that to um, make sure the gospel is heard to those people who do not know Jesus Christ yet. Thank you for using us. Thank you for using Kenneth. Thank you for using all the missionaries in this world, Father. May you be glorified. May you, may you use them to preach the gospel to the all nations. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. And if you would stand with me for our last song.